Hello, everyone. My name is E.J. Schultz, Assistant Managing Editor for AdAge, and welcome to the latest edition of AdAge Remotely. I'm so happy today to be joined by Pete Young, who is the Senior Vice President of Marketing for NASCAR. Before we get started, though, I want to remind everyone to ask questions as we go on our social channels, and please let us know where you are watching from. Hi, Pete. Welcome aboard. Hey, E.J. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, you just, at NASCAR, just this weekend, finished up your season uh, with the NASCAR Cup Series Championship in Phoenix. And I'm going to say it's probably the most unique season that NASCAR has ever had and possibly your most unique year as a, as a marketer. Obviously, like most sports leagues, you guys were forced to shut things down back in the spring as the pandemic took hold. And then you got back to racing, I think it was two months later, with no fans, and then you brought on limited numbers of fans, but you managed to get through the season. My question for you is, what was that like as the, as the guy overseeing marketing during this most unusual time? Man, it was it was a wild ride. Um, and while it was probably one of the, the toughest um, years and season, it was it was also probably the most kind of fulfilling and, and rewarding. Um, I think that the, the you know the, the key to everything was just being extremely fluid. Um, I think there's kind of a saying with uh, throughout this pandemic that there are kind of three days. There's what happened yesterday and today and, you know, and, and tomorrow. So um, it felt like every week we were kind of, you know, scenario planning, obviously, you know, safety and protocols, putting all of that first. Um, but it was, uh, you know, wild to navigate, but it really, you know, galvanized the, you know, the entire company and industry. Um, and, you know, very proud that we Crowned uh, three champions in uh, in Phoenix uh, just a few days ago, um, and got the full season in. So I'm um, re really proud about that. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you guys might have been the first kind of major pro sports league that kind of came back. Is that right? And when when was the actual date you guys started racing again? We were. It was. Um, it was. I'd say NASCAR uh, is the was the first uh, major sport back, and it was. Um, in uh, in the May time frame. So um, Darlington was the, the first uh, track that we returned to um, live without fans. Um, and really that was, you know, a huge testament to our, our competition team um, working closely with, you know, health and, and government officials, um, really kind of paving the way in terms of, you know, what protocols need to be in, in place to really, you know, safely compete and have live, you know, sports again. Um, and I think it was, you know, uh, certainly a, a learning opportunity for, you know, for, for, for all of sports, um, but certainly NASCAR. And, um, you know, after, after a few weeks under our belt, we kind of got into a good groove and, and, you know, really were able to kind of refine things sort of going forward to navigate the rest of the, uh, of the 20 schedule, 2020 schedule. And of course the whole all, total sports marketing calendar has just been upended this year. Um, I mean, they're, they're starting the masters today, as we sit here in the middle of November, which is kind of crazy. But um, from your standpoint, I know you guys are used to kind of having the summer to yourself in a sense outside of baseball and a few other things, maybe golf, but obviously this year, I mean, we had the NBA going full bore late into the summer, you know, major league baseball kind of restarted. You had all kinds of competition that you're not used to dealing with for, for the, for the viewer. Um, how did you handle that? Was there any extra pressure from a marketing standpoint to kind of, um, I mean, I guess to use a racing term, you're going, going from like zero to hundred miles an hour in, a, in the span of a few weeks competing with everyone else. What was that like? Yeah, listen, I think we want, you know, we really, I think, think that the way we think is, you know, we want all of sports to be, you know, successful. Um, it's just a very atypical calendar, you know, sports programming, live sports programming, um, I think our, one of our one of our biggest kind of challenges or opportunities was, you know, really being bullish about making sure that um, we were dialed into the storylines week in and week out. Um, things that were new, given the schedule, um, new tracks, new courses, double headers, um, midweek races, things that we've you know ha haven't done before in the past. So we really put a lot of emphasis on you know that those types of you know messages and and promotion around those things. I think we also benefited from. Um, when we were off and when we came back, um, you know, we were, you know, um, um, really the first major sport um, to, to compete live. Um, and I think that piqued the interest of, of a lot of new people. Um, and while we were off, we also, 
um, had a really successful um, esports um, uh, platform with with iRacing, a pro invitational series where our top NASCAR drivers were actually competing at the tracks we would have uh, been racing if we were racing live. And so we really kind of piqued the interest of, of new people. And I think that that has kind of, you know, helped us um, gain some, you know, some, some momentum throughout the entire season and, and helped us kind of just um, keep engagement um, really sort of sustained throughout the entire um, season that we're really, really kind of proud of where we netted out in terms of just our, our business metrics. Yeah, that's a great point in terms of just when you guys came back, people were just starved for any sports. Um, but as the competition increased, did you do anything special to kind of hold on to maybe these first time NASCAR fans? Yeah, I, th I think, um, EJ, that, you know, we're a lot of different data and, and insights, you know, that we're seeing that, again, we're, you know, new people are engaging with us. It's our owned platforms or, or television or, or social platforms. Um, and so we're, you know, really, in fact, we've, we've got a big sort of study right, right now um, in, in the market to really kind of understand who are some of these new sort of potential fans um, and what do they look like and what do they want from the car. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the type of promotion and marketing or advertising and media that we typically, you know, um, to target existing fans in certain segments, um, these new fans, we're doing new things um, to make them just kind of understand and sort of bridge that maybe a, a relevance gap there. So uh, working a lot more with uh, with celebrity celebrities and, and influencers, um, new media platforms that we haven't maybe invested in in the past. Um, and so we think this is really sort of a, you know, an opportunity really that just started this year, but we're really going to sort of carry um, over into 21 and beyond um, and kind of build on what we've learned uh, from in, in uh, 2020. Yeah, I want to get to your celebrity approach in a moment. But first, I also want to ask you about um, something else that really puts you guys under the spotlight earlier this year when you during the in the wake of the George Floyd death and the attention on, on um, social justice and racial justice, you guys made the decision to ban the Confederate flag at your racing events. Um, were you involved in that decision? And what was that like for you? Obviously, you know, NASCAR, I guess, stereotypically has a lot of connection to the South and maybe some people that maybe didn't like that decision from some of your hardcore fans. What was that like as an organization to go through that? Listen, I think, you know, another really sort of important moment in time for, for NASCAR where, you know, we, we did really take a stance against, uh, you know, these, um, you know, social injustice and, um, and and just social unrest in the country right now. Um, I wasn't um, specifically involved in the decision. You know, our, our leadership, our management, um, you know, were, were involved in kind of the, the core sort of meetings to make decisions, uh, you know, about the, uh, the Confederate flag. But, you know, the, it boils down to, you know, we need to, as, a, as an industry, as a sport, as a brand, do a better job at, you know, at listening and understanding um, and impacting where we can. And the reality is, is, you know, that, that flag was, you know, was an uncomfortable, you know, it made, made a lot of people uncomfortable, um, regardless of, um, you know, their, their demographics. And so, you know, one of our core attributes as a brand, as a sport, is to be inclusive. We want everyone to feel welcome. Um, I don't want to take away anyone's, you know, um, any anyone's uh, freedom or, or rights. But if something makes somebody uncomfortable, it just doesn't have a place at, at our properties or, or at our events. So um, I think that what it did do is opened up the door to a whole lot more people than um, a small group of of, you know, of of fans that, you know, may have been, I think initially, um, you know, maybe it didn't sit well. But way, way more kind of upside um, opportunity with, with that decision. Um, and uh, I, I think it opens up a lot of doors to us going forward. Are there, I know you guys have made some other things, uh, changes internally, maybe not quite as uh, public facing or on the diversity front. Can you update us on some other things you guys have been up to? Yeah, so we, um, re we hired a new head, uh, vice president of, of diversity inclusion uh, for the company, um, Brandon Thompson. A lot more, you know, resources and focus on diversity and inclusion, both within the company but also the industry. So um, we've got kind of a, you know, they've got sort of a three prong sort of approach um, in internal what we're doing as a company um, to support and foster, you know, greater diversity and inclusion uh, within the industry. You know, things like you know training and understanding, and then externally, and that's where there's really a close kind of connection between DNI and marketing. And I think, you know, going forward, we're going to be even more sort of aggressive in terms of, um, you know, marketing to multicultural audiences, 
um, and making sure that diversity inclusion is kind of, you know, part of our, our brand uh, messaging. Can you give us some uh, hints on what some of your future multicultural <laughs> marketing initiatives might entail? Yeah, I think so. Over over the past couple of years, I'd say we made a you know some some really good progress um, with the the Hispanic audience um, in in the U.S. here, um, and it, we're seeing you know some some momentum in terms of of growth of of, of the U.S. Hispanic sort of fandom. Um, and in 2020, I think you'll you'll see an expansion of that multicultural target audience to include African American as well. So right now, you know, we're we're working on sort of the, the strategy and and the targets and how we want to sort of position the you know the competition and the brand and the competitors, uh, a number of things. So I think you'll see that sort of manifest in various things from advertising to our media strategy to our partnerships um, and really multicultural, just to be really, you know, n not sort of a, a subset of our marketing, but really kind of integrated in everything that we do. Of course, Bubba Wallace has, has really become a star, and but I think he's your only black driver. Is that right? Uh, that is correct in the in the top series. Yeah. How important is it to recruit or to kind of increase the actual diversity of your stars, and will that then it naturally lead to more fans from the multicultural space? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a great question. Um, we for for years um, had a um, a really successful kind of recruitment program, Drive for Diversity. Um, where we recruit um, both drivers, but also, um, you know, uh, pit crew members as well. Um, a lot of former athletes. Um, and the real focus on that is, is recruiting and providing opportunities for, um, for, for um, diverse professionals. So I think you'll, you'll continue to see more diversity beyond even African-American, you know, in our, in our top series. Um, we've got a, another, you know, um, top competitor, Daniel Suarez, uh, who came up through that program as well? He's is uh, from Mexico. Came up the ranks through there. Um, he's going to be in in a great um, uh, new team next year, Track House, um, uh, which is a really kind of progressive um, model for a race team. So I think you'll see more of that, and and the you know the, the resources and, and programs that have been in place for years really kind of paying off now and going forward. And I think you also have a new some new. A new generation of owners. I, I know you guys got a lot of publicity recently when Michael Jordan entered the sport and um, I believe bought a team that uh, includes Bubba Walls. Can you update everyone on that? And, and um, now what it's like having, the, the, in my opinion, the greatest basketball player of all time on your side, what that Mike means? Bias being in Chicago. A little bit, yeah. yeah. It is great. Um, so uh, 2311 is the new team, sort of a joint venture between um, uh, Michael Jordan and uh, and Denny Hamlin, one of our top competitors as well. Uh, uh, Bubba Wallace is going to be the driver of, of the twenty three car. Um, so that's a, a great example of a you know of a, a minority owner um, it, among our our race teams. Um, also, another um, uh, I just re referenced it as well. But Trackhouse is another new team to NASCAR. Uh, Daniel Suarez is going to be um, uh, going to be their their driver. Um, and I think the way that, that you know, the, the approach and sort of philosophy and the way that the, these race teams are structured are really probably different than maybe some of our, our traditional race teams. Um, and I think really kind of poised to, you know, uh, to, to reach new audiences, to gain relevance in popular culture. Um, so really excited for what, what lies ahead for, for those two teams in particular. Could, could we see Michael maybe in some marketing in, in the coming year? I, I we'll see. We'll see. He's he's a busy, busy man, um, but he is very engaged. Um, and I think he's, you know, really committed. He wants to see, you know, Bubba thrive and succeed. Um, and uh, and I really think he, you know, is committed to NASCAR and seeing, you know, the transformational journey that we're on and contributing, contributing to that in a, in a positive way. Before we continue, I want to give a few shout outs to some of our viewers. Um, Chelsea is watching from California. Aletta is watching from New York. We have Kelly from Florida and, and Lindsay from Canada. Canada, Welcome, everyone. And definitely please let us know if you have uh, questions for Pete about NASCAR um, as we go. I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about your, your advertising approach. You mentioned earlier you guys have been using a lot more celebrities. But before I do that, I want to queue up a, a spot that you guys ran recently featuring uh, Gabby Douglas, if we could watch that. Every journey begins with a single step. 
What started as a 10 race quest is now down to the final lap. The Bill France Cup is right around these turns, and one of four drivers will take it home. One with a leg up all season as he finally tries to bust down the championship door. Two teammates, former champions, racing for another title. And the son of a NASCAR legend looking to write his own chapter in racing's history books. While the NASCAR season is a marathon, Phoenix is a sprint. 312 miles between glory and second place. The driver who grabs the gold needs the best finish of the four contenders to earn the championship. One mistake can end championship dreams, and one bold move can solidify legacy. Is youth served? Can the favorite cap his season with the cup, or will either teammate steal the show? <coughs> the journey is almost complete. After a season like no other, a champion is crowned in Phoenix. So I don't think Gabby Douglas is necessarily the first person people think of when they think of NASCAR. Um, can you explain this approach and what you're trying to achieve? And yeah, maybe, yeah, I know you had some other stars as well. Maybe you can kind of update us. Yeah, and, and that's the point. I think what we what we learned, um, you know, in the probably over the summer months is some of these people that were newer to NASCAR, they were asking us questions on, you know, on on social and and, and other sort of channels like, how does this work? You know, who's going to qualify? And it's really for a for a for a NASCAR fan, you know, the playoffs is pretty straightforward and how you qualify and the eliminations and all that. Um, but our our kind of strategy around what we're calling sort of a, a NASCAR commercial series um, is to tap into a various uh, variety of celebrities. So probably 10 or so uh, over the 10 week period of, of the playoffs. Um, some other athletes, um, comedians, uh, celebrities. Um, and the purpose was to not talk to to existing NASCAR fans, but to talk to some of these other you know sports fans or people that, that we've kind of piqued their interest in in the past couple uh, months in particular. So the way that we kind of approached it is, um, you know, we we had the the celebrity kind of launch them on their channel. Um, in many cases, we we boosted that um, from from their channel, um, and then we used it in some of our media that that wasn't that had a you know, low propensity of, of having NASCAR fans. And it was really just to sort of help with sort of a, uh, an additional understanding, okay, this is the round of 12 elim eliminations. These are the four drivers that are on the bubble. This is sort of what needs to happen. So kind of what, what you know, to expect and what people should sort of, you know, look for. Um, and then just also putting NASCAR in more relevant places where, um, you know, some of the, these new near sort of fans um, uh, tend to be. Yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting decision marketers have to make whether and it's and just because politics is on everyone's mind. Do you fire up your base, you know, and do you really try to turn out your base when it comes to to a brand, or do you try to win over new fans or voters in a sense? And it sounds yeah. like you kind of you guys have kind of veered off, not veered, but taken the approach to try to win new viewers. At at what point? How do you go about deciding, you know, whether or not that's worth the effort? So I think that um, it's very, you know, very different, the strategy and the messaging. So, you know, I actually didn't because I'm a I'm a diehard NASCAR fan. So I actually didn't see a lot of the, you know, the content from these NASCAR commercials because I'm not I'm not the target. Um, but I am the target, you know, as a NASCAR fan. So, you know, on NBC Sports or, you know, or Sirius Radio or other channels, you um, the, the the messaging, the creative, the advertising is, is very was very, very different. So I don't think it was kind of either or. I think we gave the NASCAR fans, you know, the hype, the storylines, what to look for, um, you know, week in and week out. Um, and then we gave the kind of new near potential NASCAR fans, um, you know, a little bit more sort of um, entertainment um, and sort of, you know, softer messaging and here's how it works, you know, here's what to look for. So I don't think I would I would describe it as like you know at the um, at the um, risk of of like our, our current fans. Um, I think you, we they just need something sort of different than our than our um, than than our existing fans. I think you guys also reached out to some NFL fans via uh, an ad with uh, Baker Mayfield. I think we have that one as well. Let's take a look. And from the great state of Ohio, Hartford Township, standing at five foot nine hundred and sixty-five pounds, crushing hearts since New Year's Eve of 1993, driving the number 12 car for Team Penske. Here we go, give it up for Ryan Michael Blaney. So, 
similar as the NASCAR commercials. That was at the the beginning of the playoffs where we took the the sixteen dri drivers that have had uh, um, that that qualified for the playoffs, and we paired them with a celebrity that they had some sort of connection with. So obviously, Blaney being from uh, Ohio and a, a Browns fan. Um, so again, you know, really reaching more of in that case, you know, Baker's fans um, and Browns fans, and drawing that connection of of one of our sort of top con uh, competitors that um, was qualified in the uh, in the playoffs. We do have a question uh, from the audience. This is from Sabrina, who is watching on Facebook. She's asking, "How are you uh, changing the conversation among the fans? Making changes when in the industry is one thing, but how does that change show up with fans?" in terms of behavior and attitude? It's changing the conversations among the fans. So, you know, I don't know that the conversation has really changed that much. Um, I think that we're, you know, we're, you know, I, I think that part of our conversation or part of our, our, you know, essence as a brand or as a sport is, is to be inclusive. And I think we're just more kind of forthcoming, uh, you know, about that. I think that, um, one of the things that our our social team I think does a really good job at um, is really kind of you know the personalized sort of one to one sort of dialogue, um, and and I think as we kind of you know continue to cultivate new fans that tend to be younger and and more diverse, um, you know I think the way that, that we engage with them whether it's one to one on our own platforms or through social or 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 you know broadcast media. Um, you know, I think it will be tailored some, but I don't, you know, I don't know that we're, we're, you know, changing what NASCAR is all about, just reinforcing that we're inclusive, um, and, you know, for, for all people, all, all uh, types of, of uh, sports fans. So I know you guys just finished your season and you're probably ready to take a little break, but you have not too long from now, you'll be starting things up again. And NASCAR is so unique when it comes to major sports leagues because you start out with like one of your biggest events, which is, of course, the Daytona 500, which is in February, right? Um, taking what you learned from this past season with all the changes um, made during the pandemic and the likelihood that we'll probably still, unfortunately, be in the throes of it in February. What are you, what are you looking forward to in February? Are you planning to welcome fans back at a higher level? What what How are you preparing? Yeah, I, it is going to be the, the name of the game is, you know, continues to be sort of scenario planning. Um, the Daytona 500 is definitely our, our biggest event. Um, and it is um, an incredible, you know, uh, event for, you know, anyone that, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a bucket list event for sure. Um, I, we, we will be welcoming fans. Um, I think that, you know, the capacity sort of, you know, guidance and limitations, I think we really want to be in line, in step with uh, guidance from the CDC. Um, so that is a bit fluid right now. Um, we actually have a number of events that lead up to the, the Daytona 500, some of our, our support series as well, Xfinity and, uh, and, uh, and, and the truck series. Um, so I think it's, it's also about, you know, maybe balancing some of the, the spectators in person uh, between the various events. Um, you know, I think we, we want as many people to experience NASCAR live as, as possible. Um, but first and foremost, it's about, you know, a, a safe experience for, for everyone that, you know, the, the fans and, and the competitors. Um, and so I don't think we'll, you know, don't envision we would do anything that would, that would compromise that in any way. In our remaining time, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sponsorships. I know that's not 100% your responsibility, but as the marketer, I know you're probably involved a little bit. And um, NASCAR made a huge change, I think, effective this year with you, you went away from having a title sponsor and to having kind of four, I think you call them premier partners, um, Bush Beer, Coca-Cola, Geico, and Xfinity. How is that going? It's going really well. Um, you know, I think that it was a, a pretty sort of progressive, you know, model or concept. Um, we've got, I think, four tremendous partners with tremendous brands. So we're really kind of, you know, humble to, you know, be part of them in terms of um, contributing and at some level to kind of the, the you know, the caretaking of, of their brands. Um, I think it really just, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. I think that, um, you know, we're, we've we're doing, a, you know, a lot of valuation around the value to those four partners, um, which has really been an encouraging story, um, even though it's been a, a very kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a atypical season. Um, but what it's it's allowed us to do is really kind of further integrate them into our different kind of marketing platforms. So Coca-Cola is a presenting sponsor of our Salutes campaign. 
um, and which is all about military and over kind of a, a six, seven week period um, in, in the season. Geico um, really integrated in NASCAR returns. So the first, you know, five, six weeks of the season where most eyeballs and a lot of momentum um, are around the sport. Um, and it really kind of allows us to do, you know, to really kind of enrich sort of our, our marketing strategies and, and messaging and promotion and activation. So I think it's going really well. Um, we learned a lot, um, you know, both at the NASCAR team and our partners at um, at, at Comcast, uh, Anheuser Busch, um, Coke, and uh, and Geico, um, and really excited to kind of build on that in in 21 and beyond. Of course, you know one of the benefits for sponsors usually in NASCAR is it's a sport that I know you do a lot of activations around letting people really get up close to your drivers and yeah. pre-race events and hospitality events after the races. Obviously, most of that was kind of shut down this year. What, but I know in talking to a couple of your sponsors, you guys have kind of pivoted, of course, like everyone to kind of Zoom events, th things yeah. like that. How How is that? And will that continue next year? It definitely will continue. And, and like I just said, you know, so much learning, um, different technology and platforms to make the the virtual sort of experience as meaningful and valuable as, as possible. Um, you know, I, I think this is this is all new to us, right? When we were earlier in the year figuring out like, oh, you know, how do we do this kind of virtual hospitality or whatever? Um, but I think there, there's there's a lot of pretty incredible technology out there and, and platforms. Um, and I think people, you know, whether it's, you know, B2B or, or consumers and fans, I think people have been more accustomed and comfortable um, and appreciative of sort of virtual experiences and virtual hospitality and that sort of thing. So we've already got some ideas um, to kind of, you know, take that to sort of new levels in, in 2021. Um, and uh, until we're able to, you know, safely do more stuff in person. What would your advice be to brands out there that might be watching in terms of how to effectively activate a sponsorship right now, whether it be NASCAR or another sports league right now? You know, I just say don't, um, I, I just say be true to, to who you are, your brand, your story. Um, don't force anything. Um, I think that you know, some people feel like, oh, you know, but so and so is doing this. So I feel like, you know, our brand should be doing that. That may not necessarily be the case. I'd say, you know, maybe don't you obviously want to be kind of on the on the forefront of, of change and innovation. Um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't rush if you still sort of have questions or, you know, aren't sure if it's kind of, you know, fits with your your brand or, or your story. Um, but I just say, you know, stay true to who you are, um, you know, it, it, and, and it's going to obviously, you know, be a little bit different uh, in the middle of a pandemic, um, but that doesn't make it any, you know, less great. So we're running out of time. I do have one more question I want to get to from the audience. This comes from Pete on LinkedIn. He's asking, has NASCAR any plans towards international audience audiences in the current um, digital transformation. Obviously, you guys are such an American sport. Do you, do you have any international ambitions or how's that going? We do. So we have uh, a series in Mexico. We have a series in Canada. We have a series in Europe. So a lot of people don't know that. Um, so uh, we pr probably need to do a better job of making people aware of of, of, of those series and, and that the racing in, in those um, those countries. Um, in addition to that, international is a is a huge priority for us. Um, I'm I'm pretty certain that you will, you know, uh, in the next couple of months, be seeing some announcements from NASCAR in terms of plans to enter a few additional markets as well. Um, and uh, I, you know, it, it's obviously been a, a little bit sort of on pause given given the global pandemic. Um, but international expansion is a is a major kind of growth strategy for uh, for the company. Do you want to break some news here and tell us where yeah, those markets are? I'd probably get fired if I did. <laughs> okay. I had to try, but um, we are out of time. I, I, I want to thank you, Pete, for your time today, and good luck as you plan for the Daytona 500 here in just a few months. Thanks so much, EJ. Great to talk to you.